Hey everyone, thanks for joining Learn to Play Games. My name is Lance, and today I'll be doing a teaching video for Zombicide Invader. This is the latest game from Come On Games' is Zombicide series, and is a 1-6 to six player game that takes roughly 45 minutes to an hour and a half to play. It's a fully cooperative game, so all the players are working together to defeat the scenario they've chosen to go on. In this video, I'm going to teach you how to play starting with components, setup, and three phases of the game round and end game conditions. As always, if you find these videos helpful, if you like what I do, please consider that like button subscribe to my channel. I know everybody asks for it, and it's one of the easiest ways you can support channels like mine so we can continue to grow and get new games to teach and show off and make new content on. Please take those couple seconds, hit that button for me, and drop by in the comments below as well. Let me know what kind of videos you guys are interested in, if there's other types of videos you'd like to see from the channel, if there's other things you'd like me to do more, like playthrough videos, and what you think of the format of these videos. I'm always open to hearing from you guys. So, as always, if you want to stay up to date on all my videos, also consider ringing that bell so you get notifications anytime I release new content. And let's head to the table, and I'll teach you guys how to play. The first deck cards I'm going to look at are the equipment cards, and this is going to have a variety of different types of cards in it. First, there's going to be different types of weapon cards, and each of these is going to have the name of the weapon on the top, listing whether the weapon is noisy or silent, where the weapon is going to be equipped, with some areas being in the hand, some in the body, and some being upgrades, and I'll explain that more in a minute. Then you have an image of the weapon, and the type of weapon. There are bullet-fed weapons and energy weapons. Underneath that is the type of weapon it is, whether it's a ranged weapon or a melee weapon, and then the four different stats for that, which first is the range. So with this heavy shotgun, it has a range of one to two spaces. Next is the number of dice you're going to throw when making an attack with this. The third number is the number you have to roll equal to or greater than on each of those dice to score a hit. And the final number is the amount of damage that weapon does. And this is going to be significant for some of the enemies. And I'll go into more detail about this later. Some of the weapons are also going to have the dual wield icon, which means that you can have a weapon of that same type in each hand as long as it's the same weapon. So with the heavy cutter, it can be dual wielded with another heavy cutter. Next, there are going to be body type items that can be equipped to your body slots and each of these will provide some sort of benefit and will have a name on the side of the card. Then there's going to be upgrade cards or attachment cards. Each one of these will be slid underneath a weapon and will provide you with certain things such as with the energy cell this can be equipped to an energy weapon in which will allow you to re-roll all your attack dice with that one time. Now, it can also be used on a prototype weapon, but a prototype weapon must have an energy cell in order to be used, and I'll cover this a little bit more later. Now, the equipment deck is not a completely safe area, as you are going to have mold spawn cards in there as well. The nice thing about these is once you resolve the card, then you do get to draw an additional equipment card, so that you hopefully will get something and not have another mold spawn card come out. There's also going to be two other types of weapon cards. You'll have prototype weapons, which are going to be a little bit better versions of other cards that you'll find in the equipment deck. And each of these is going to work just like the other equipment cards I've already outlined. The one exception to these is that they are all energy weapons and must have an energy cell in order to power them. Now this will also grant them the reroll that the energy cell normally does. Next, you have the gray-backed weapons, and these are going to be the starter items. At the beginning of the game, each survivor is going to receive one of these weapons, either by choice or the players can randomly deal them out. Next, there are two new types of robots. You have the Sentry Gun and the Peacekeeper Bot. And each one of these is going to work similarly to other types of weapons, where if a survivor has the control token or if they have the remote control skill, then they can operate these bots. Or with the sentry gun, if you're in the same zone as it, then you can use the sentry gun by spending an action. Each one of these also has the prototype and low profile special rules. First with the prototype, this means that they can fire into dark zones and fire into exterior zones. And the low profile means that they will not take friendly fire if other survivors fire into their space. Finally, there's oxygen tanks, which the players will be able to go to the, the oxygen supply room and pick up an oxygen tank for an action, and these will allow the players to move into exterior zones. This is the only way players can move into exterior zones. They must have an oxygen tank equipped at that time. And these do not run out, so the players, once they have them and they're equipped, they can go out into exterior zones for the remaining portion of the scenario. The second deck of cards are the Xeno cards or the spawn deck, and this is going to contain four different types of cards in it. 
each of these cards is going to have a title that'll tell you what type of card it is. And then it's going to have the four different levels of spawning based on the survivor that is, has the most experience. So if all the survivors are in blue, then you'll resolve the blue results and so on and so forth. Now, some of the cards are also going to have an extra activation and these will only take effect in yellow through red. If you're still in blue, then these have no effect. The abomination cards are new as each one of these not only will spawn a new abomination if there isn't one out there, but it will also cause the abomination that's out there to move. So some really nasty cards and there's actually a fair number of these in the deck. The final set of cards are the mold spawn cards and these will have you spawning a certain enemy type that's listed in each one of the active mold spaces. And I'll go into more detail about this later, but these are new, the new terrifying cards that are in the deck. Survivor cards are each going to have the name of the survivor on the top and then an icon next to the name. And in Zombicide Invader, there are two different types of survivors. You have civilian survivors and soldier survivors. And this is mainly going to impact where the players can search. And I'll go into more detail about this later. Then going down the side of the card are all the different skills that survivor has. And each survivor only starts with the blue skill. And then as they level up, they will unlock these additional skills. And I'll show you how that works later. Going down the side of the card is the, the survivor's health, with most civilian survivors starting at 2. And the soldiers, some of them will start on 3 or higher, such as Magnus here. He actually has a starting ability that lets him start with 6 health. Each player is going to receive one or more survivor dashboards, and these are going to keep track of each survivor they have, all the equipment they have, experience, and skills that they've unlocked. Each one of these boards is going to have locations for body items, such as armor and oxygen tanks backpacks to store additional items, and finally areas for weapons to be placed along with attachments that can be slid underneath that weapon so that you know what it's attached to. Each board is also going to have locations for the pegs to be placed. As the survivor gains experience on the bottom of the track, he will unlock new skills, and then when he does, he'll simply place a new peg marking the skill that he's unlocked. On the side here is the survivor's health, and as the survivor loses health, you can move that track down, and if it ever reaches the bottom, the survivor has died. Throughout the game, players are going to be gaining experience by defeating Xenos and picking objectives and doing other things based on the scenario they've played. Each time they gain experience, they're going to move their experience track up, and each time they cross into a new color, they're going to gain that ability right away. So for example, with Jared, when he goes into yellow, he's going to gain one action that he can use right away during his turn. When he moves into orange, then he can choose one of the two orange abilities to gain. So he can either add a die to his melee or add charge. And then he'll place the marker on there. And once you select an ability, that is yours for the rest of the game. You cannot choose to alternate between the abilities. And the same for red. You would choose one of those abilities to gain, adding the marker, and that is your ability for the rest of the game. There are four different types of enemies included in Zombicide Invader. The first are workers that get one action point, require one damage to kill, and gain one experience point. Hunters get two actions, require one damage to kill, and gain the player one experience point. Tanks get one action, require two damage to kill, and gain the player one experience point. And finally, the big abominations that get one action, require three damage to kill, and gain the player five experience for defeating them. And the last thing I want to look at before moving into the setup is the tiles themselves. So each tile is going to have a code in each one of the corners to help you during setup for the scenarios that are included in the game. Each tile is double-sided, and with some of the tiles, they're going to be comprised of two different types of environments. You have the exterior locations and the interior locations. With the exterior locations, each of them is going to be separated by these pair of pipelines. And if they're connected with other tiles like this one, this is considered one space, where this is considered one space. And then if this one was all exterior locations, that would also be considered one space. Moving into the interior location, there are going to be rooms and corridors. On this side, these are all rooms, and each one of these is going to be separated by the walls with the spaces where there are going to be entrances into the other rooms. And there are four different types of rooms. You have the regular rooms with no special features. You have security rooms, which is where the soldiers are going to be able to search. The oxygen supply rooms, where you can go and get oxygen. And the airlocks, which are the only rooms that you can leave the facility into exterior zones from. And the only time you can leave an airlock is if your, ex your survivor has oxygen. Moving on to the back of the tiles... 
this will show you a corridor. And corridors are going to be separated again by these little sections here to separate each space from one another. But other than that, they are connected. And with the corridors, they are not restricted with line of sight. So you can see from one end to another, in, unlike the rooms where you can only see one room ahead. And I'll go into more detail about this during the line of sight section. Moving into setup, first off, choose a scenario that you'd like to play from the book, or alternatively, you can customize and create your own. For this video, I went ahead and made my own, and then you'll lay out the tiles and all the different tokens according to the scenario you've chosen or however you want to make it. Then go ahead and place out the spawn deck or alien card deck and shuffle it up along with the equipment deck. Place out any of the different bots or sentries that you're using, shuffle up the prototype deck, and you can also place out the oxygen tank deck. Also make sure you have your mold cards out, and you also want to place out the doors that you have access to, and your noise counters. Place out any dice that you'll be using for the game. Finally, with the objectives, go ahead and take those out if most of the scenarios are going to include these. And with mine, I am going to need to find the blue key card, which is the blue objective, and we'll go ahead and shuffle these up, and then place them out in the designated areas. For player setup, each player will receive a dashboard per survivor that they're playing, and then they're going to choose that survivor's color, getting a base for that survivor's miniature, and five pegs of that survivor. If the players have chosen to play ultra red mode, then they will receive eight pegs instead, which you'll place the additional pegs on the side here. Finally, each player will either choose a starting item or be randomly dealt one, depending upon how the players want to proceed. Each player starts with a starting st uh, skill and the number of hit points that they have based on the player they're playing. And then each player also makes sure that your tracker is at the zero mark for experience. The final steps are to place out the figures in the starting location, which again will be designated by the scenario you're playing or wherever you decide to start in your custom scenario. And then finally, you're going to choose one player to be the starting player. And you can do this as a group or roll off the dice or however you want to do it. Remember, this is a cooperative game. You guys are working together. So talk about this. Decide who you want to go first. I'm going to go ahead and have my player over here be the starting player. And then we're ready to move into the game. Zombie Side Invader is played over an undefined number of rounds, and during each round is broken down into three phases. The Player Phase, Xeno's Phase, and End Phase. And this is going to continue until one of the endgame conditions is met. Either if you're playing a scenario, you met all the objectives and have made it off the map, or one of the players dies, in which case then the game is over and the players have lost. Ooh, I made a mistake here. So with the objectives, you cannot be placed on molds. They actually destroy objectives, so I'm going to place it here instead. Before moving into the first phase of the game, I want to cover a couple important rules. The first is line of sight, and there's an ex excellent example in the rulebook on this, so if there's any questions about that, make sure you check that out as well as you can see here. It really does cover just about everything. That being said, there are going to be some different variations depending upon where the survivors are located. With interior locations, the survivors are going to have corridors and rooms. A survivor can see as far as a corridor stretches into the first room that it connects to if it connects to a room in a straight line. With rooms, a survivor can see one zone away in any open zone uh, that connects to that room. So for example, if I have a survivor in this room, she can see out into this corridor as there's an opening. She can see into the security room as there's an opening and into this room as there's an opening here. She cannot see to an exterior location even though there's an opening, as there are no openings to exterior locations except for the airlocks. Now, if she is in a corridor, so let's say that she is in this room, she can see past this corridor into this room here. But if she was in this room, she could only see into this room here and not the corridor. And then likewise, in this room, she cannot see into this room as there is a solid wall between these two areas. And then with exterior locations, a survivor can see as far as that location goes in a straight line. So again, my survivor here could see all the way to the sentry gun here. If she was here, she could see all the way down here or all the way down there. It is going to be stopped by walls, so she cannot see into the building. Even if she was in this zone here, airlocks also block line of sight, so she would not be able to see into that room either. The other important thing I want to go into is the mold tokens. So anytime a spoiler Abomination is spawned in a room. He is going to place a mold token in that room. And when a token is placed, it's going to destroy any objectives or closed doorways in that room. And make sure you check the objective because if it's one that you need, then you have lost the mission right away. 
Also, if a mold token is placed in a special room, such as the security room or oxygen supply room, those rooms will cease to function for their special ability, so you will not be able to gain oxygen anymore if a mold token is placed in an oxygen room. Each time the spoiler abomination moves, he will place a, spa a new mold token, and if the mold tokens ever connect one spawn point to another, the mission is over. And this is counted in straight lines, it is not counted diagonally. The one exception to this is if a spoiler abomination is on the exterior location, mold tokens are never added to exterior locations. Now there's a couple other important rules with spawn tokens. They are double sided with an active side and an inactive side. And each time a mold token is placed in a room, it will open up doorways or passages to other rooms that are connecting to it, even if normally there was walls there. The one exception to this, again, is that it will not connect exterior locations. So, for example, if the mold token was placed in this room here, it would open up a doorway to this room, as normally there isn't a doorway, but with the mold token in there, it will open it up. With the active side up, that is going to have a couple of special rules. First off, if a hellfire is placed in there, it will destroy it and flip it over to its inactive side, and it is considered a room for line of sight purposes with the active side up. So you can only see one zone away. With the inactive side, it will not be able to spawn enemies in it with the special mold cards, and it will not count as a connection between the spawn points if there are some molds along that pathway. And it is considered a corridor. So if you have multiple inactives, you can see through those as they are considered corridors. The first phase in each round is the player's phase, and this is going to start with the player that has the first player token and proceed in a clockwise manner. During each player's turn, they get to activate their survivors in any order that they choose, spending the three actions that survivor has or more, depending upon the survivor's experience level, performing a number of different actions, which are move, search, door activation, reorganize and trade, combat action, take and activate an objective, make noise, do nothing, or machine actions. And I'm going to take you through each one of these in order to show you how they all work. Once a player's turn is done, it'll proceed to the next player in clockwise order to take their turn. And once all players are done, then they're going to move on to the next phase. Each move action you take allows you to move from your zone to an adjacent zone in a straight line. You are never allowed to move in a diagonal direction, and you cannot go through closed doorways or solid walls. You also cannot move from a zone to an exterior zone unless you're using an airlock. The one other important thing is that if you are in a zone with Xenos, each Xeno that is in your zone is going to cost you one additional move action to move out of it. So if my survivor wanted to move into this zone, she would have to spend one move action plus an additional move action per Xeno that's in her zone for a total of two to move into that zone. And if a survivor has enact a skill that allows her to move multiple zones per move action, if she moves into a location with Xenos, that immediately ends her move action. But she can spend another move action then to move out. But again, any Xenos in that zone are going to add an additional action for that. A survivor that is in a room zone that contains no Xenos and is not a corridor or exterior location can perform one search action during their turn. They can only do this once even if this is a free search action that is granted by a skill. When they do this, they're going to reveal the top card of the equipment deck. If it is a piece of equipment, they can equip it immediately and rearrange their inventory for free. They can also discard it immediately if they want to. So for example, with my survivor, she can put the cattle prod in her backpack and immediately equip the heavy cutter. The one other important note with this is that soldiers are only allowed to search in security rooms, where the civilians can search in security rooms and regular rooms. Again, they cannot search in rooms that contain Xenos, corridors, or exterior locations. They can also not search in rooms that have mold, and if you draw a mold spawning card, then you'll resolve the effects of that card, and then you'll also get to draw an additional equipment card from the deck. The one other important note with this is that each room has no limit on the number of times it can be searched, so each of the survivors in a room can search it once during their turn. The door activation action is a free action that can be performed once per turn, and the survivor can either place or remove a closed door token on a door opening to a zone they occupy. This action cannot be performed on a door opening shared with a mold zone, or if there's a destroyed door token there. So in my example here, the survivor has a worker and a tank closing in on her. She can choose to place a door as a free action, but she cannot place it in a zone that's connected with a mold zone. 
she cannot place it in a zone that has a destroyed door. So if the only zone she could place it in with this one is this zone that's connecting the tank or into the zone with the corridor. Likewise, she if this door was already placed here, she could choose to remove this for free, adding it back to the supply. And there's only five neutral doors that the players will be able to work with. So if all of them are out or destroyed, the players will not be able to close any more doors during the game. A reorganize and trade action is going to allow you to reorganize your inventory any way you want to. And it's also going to allow you to trade with one other survivor that is in the same zone as you. You can only do this with one other survivor. And this, with this trade action, it does not have to be fair or even. This is a fully cooperative game, so sometimes it's better just to give other survivors good equipment. So in this example, Masuki and Magnus are in the same zone, so they're going to do a trade action. Magnus is going to give Masuki the energy cell so that she can reroll with her heavy cutter. He's also going to give her the armor so that she is a little bit more protected. And he's going to place his sludge in his backpack. Masuki is also going to trade him the SMG so that he can dual wield those and she's going to give him the bot remote control token as she has that ability already and does not need the token to control the bot. Once the trade is done, the players can reorganize their inventories any way they want to as well. A combat action is broken down into two different types, melee combat and ranged combat, and I'm going to take you through each one of those in detail. The first one I'm going to look at is melee combat. So with this example, Jared's in a little bit of trouble in his space. He's got two workers and a tank but he does have the heavy cutter, which is a melee weapon with the melee symbol at the bottom here. In order to do this, he's going to spend an action to perform that attack, and then he's going to check his weapon to make sure he has range. With most melee weapons, they're going to be range zero, which means the enemy must be in the same space as you. Then you're going to gather up the number of dice that are shown on that weapon. And if you have dual wielding weapons with the dual wield symbol, which both weapons must be the same, so if he had a second set of heavy cutters, he could double that value. But right now he only has one, so he's going to roll two dice. And he's looking for a three or better on each die to score a hit. And he rolled two successes, so then he's going to allocate this, those successes. And with the heavy cutter, it does two damage per hit. And like I already talked about, the workers are one damage to kill, but the tank is two damage. And with melee weapons, you get to choose who you want to allocate damage to. So he's going to do one of the hits against the tank, eliminating that, and the other hit he'll go against one of the workers. And he'll gain two experience for that one per enemy that he defeated, and these will be returned back to the supply. And the other type of combat is ranged combat. In order to do this, you'll select a weapon that you have equipped that has the range symbol, and then you'll choose a zone within the weapon's range and that you have line of sight to. With ranged weapons, they have two numbers. The first is the minimum range of the weapon, and the second is the maximum range of the weapon. So with the SMG, it has a range of 1 to 1, which means that you can only target a space that is one space away from the space you're in. From there, then, you're going to select a zone to target, and this is going to follow a targeting priority, as you can see on this chart. So the enemy that is highest on this priority is going to take hits first, and if you can't do enough damage to that enemy to eliminate them, then your entire attack is wasted. For example, with the SMG it only does one damage, and tanks need two damage to eliminate, or a weapon that does two damage. So if Jared targeted this space, the tank would step forward taking all the hits, even if he, Jared rolled a number of successes, it would not eliminate him, and so the worker would be fine and protected by the tank. The other thing is that if a survivor is in a space that you target, any misses are going to hit the survivors in that space, and the players can divide those hits up any way they like to. So in my example, Jared is going to target this space with the workers, as that is the only space that he can eliminate and be safe without having to worry about hitting Vivian. So he's going to get his two dice and give them a roll, and he's looking for fives or sixes, and he missed both. So if he would have targeted this space, then Vivian would have taken two hits. And then you'll also add a noise token to that space as the SMG does make noise. So let me show you one other example. Let's go ahead and switch it out and give him the light machine gun. So with this one, it has a range of one to three spaces. Now remember in buildings, you can only target rooms that are one space away. But if Jared was in the hallway here, and let's say that there was an enemy way down here, he could target them. And any survivors or enemies that are in between his space and the target space are not affected by the attack. So he could target this enemy, even though we have a couple of models in between, and they will not take any hits, even for misses with the survivor. The Concentrated Fire special rule can be used with both melee and ranged combat, and allows your survivor to choose a single target and potentially bring down larger targets than they normally can. 
With the Concentrated Fire Special Rule, each successful hit's damage is added together cumulatively against the target that you choose. So for example, with the Light Machine Gun, it only does one damage, which is normally not enough to bring down a tank or abomination, as the tank needs two damage and the abomination needs three. But with the Concentrated Fire Special Rule, let's say that our Jared targets the abomination, and he rolls this result. Each successful hit's damage is added together, so each successful hit does one damage. So one, two, three, four successful hits, so four damage is enough to bring the down the Abomination and eliminate him. Now, since we rolled more than was needed, the extra hits are not transferred to other enemies. As Concentrated Fire, you must choose one enemy only to target. Taking or activating an objective action will allow a player that is in the same space as a objective to either pick it up and reveal it or to activate it depending upon whatever the parameters or the scenario are. And make sure you're familiar with that as a lot of objectives will give survivors experience points or other benefits such as prototype weapons. A survivor can also choose to spend an action to make noise and for each action they spend they're going to add a noise token to the space they're currently in. A survivor can also choose to do nothing. You are not required to spend your actions during your turn, so you can simply pass or end your turn without spending all of your actions. And the last type of action some of these survivors can do is the machine action, and this is going to allow the survivors to control different machines that are out there, such as the bots and the sentry gun. Now, a survivor can do this in one of two ways. With the bot, if they have the remote control bot special ability or sentry gun special ability per se, they can control it remotely or if they have one of the tokens for that. So with the bot token or sentry gun token, a survivor can use it as well. From there, a survivor can activate a bot that it has control of by spending an action and then they can do either a move a ranged attack or a melee attack just like with any other survivor it works the same way now anytime a bot is activated you're going to place an activation token on it for, and for the rest of the rounds then that bot is going to be considered a survivor and xenos will attack it and one damage will destroy a bot one important note with this is that if a bot is destroyed it is not the end of the mission unless the objective says otherwise during the end phase this token will be removed and if a bot or sentry gun does not have a token, then the Xenos will ignore it. For example, if we had a hunter in this space and the Xenos activated, normally it would attack anything in its space, but the sentry gun has not activated, so it will simply continue moving on as if it wasn't there. The one other important note is with the bot, if you have a survivor that controls it and it, the survivor moves, the bot can follow it as well unless it's spending any, the survivor is spending a special move ability or skill that it has, then it will not follow that. And a bot does not benefit from any skills a survivor has or rerolls. So if a survivor has some sort of special ability in combat, the bot will not take advantage of that and will just do its own action if the survivor uses it as as an action. Now that I've covered all the different actions survivors can take, let me put this all together and show you a player round in action. So starting with my first player, the player that has a first player token, he is going to activate his survivors in any order that he wants. And this player is controlling two survivors, Misuki and Magnus. So he's gonna go ahead and go with Magnus first. And his first action, he's gonna move into this room. His second action, he'll go ahead and search. And he found a heavy cutter, so he's gonna go ahead and equip that. And his third action, he will go ahead and pick up this objective. And it's not the blue objective I'm looking for, so it'll just be simply set off to the side, but it will gain him five experience points, so he'll move his experience up by five. His turn is done at that point, so then it is going to move to Misuki, as that is the other survivor that my player is controlling. So as her first action, she has the remote control bot, so she's going to activate the bot and move him forward one. His, and he's going to have the activation token placed on him. His second action, he's going to go ahead and take a shot. And following his card, you can see he has a range of one to three. He's going to roll five dice, and he's looking for fives or better. And I scored three hits, so that'll eliminate both of those Xenos. And the bots, any kills the bot does will transfer over to my player, so I'm going to gain two experience for that. Her last action, she is going to go ahead and pick up this control, and as her free action, she's going to go ahead and drop a door token, closing this door here from that hunter. Then the other player will activate. He has two survivors as well, so he can choose the order in which they're going to activate. So he'll go ahead and go with Vivian next. 
she is going to search and we found some mold spawns so it's going to place a worker in each active mold zone so we have two there and then she still gets to draw an equipment card so she found some energy or a uh, energy cell so she's going to go ahead and equip it to her cattle prod as that is an energy weapon and that'll get her re-rolls as her second action she is going to move into this room with Masuki and as her third action she is going to stop there and do nothing else so then it's going to move on to Jared to go so he is also going to search as he is in a security room he found a heavy shotgun so that's good as his first action his second action he's going to go ahead and take a shot into this room here and the heavy shotgun has a range of one to two it's going to roll two dice and he's looking for fours or better he got one successful hit so it's going to target the tank that's in priority and he will gain one experience for that as the shotgun does two points of damage he will he was able to bring down that tank and he will drop a noise token in there and then his second shot he's going to go ahead and target these guys in this room and see if he can bring any of them down he got one more success so he again will mark one experience he'll add one more noise token and eliminate one of those enemies that's all the actions that he can do so that is the end of the survivor's turn and at this point we're ready to move into the xeno's turn the second phase in the round is the xeno phase and during this phase it is split into two separate steps the first step is activation so any xenos currently out on the board are going to activate starting with the attacks so any xeno that is in the same space as survivors is going to attack and do damage so let's say for example that this worker was in with these survivors so during this step it would attack doing one damage to one of the survivors and it's up to the players how they want to split this damage up likewise if there was two xenos in there the survivors could have both xenos attack one of the survivors or they could split the damage between both of the survivors however the players want to do it so with this one, let's go ahead and say that Magnus takes the hit. So he's going to drop his armor down by one point. And then any other Xenos would activate that needed to resolve an attack. And if a Xeno is in the same space as a bot that has the activation token on it, it will attack the bot as well. If that is the only target in there or if the players nominate that as a target for the Xenos. And no matter how many Xenos are in a space, let's go ahead and say, for example, that we had a bunch of Xenos in here and they all attacked and our players chose to have jared take all the hits so even though there are more xenos in here than the damage that he could take they all will gang up and attack him at once now that would eliminate him which most of the scenarios will if one of these starting survivors is killed then the mission is over but let's go ahead and say that the machine was in here instead and they chose to the survivors chose the machine to go down so the machine would die only taking one damage but all of that all of the xenos in there would attack the machine and so they would not attack the other survivors once all the xenos that can attack are done then any xeno that did not attack is going to move one space towards either the closest survivors within line of sight and the most noise or if they don't have line of sight to any survivors the space of most noise by the shortest possible path so activating this, this Xeno here is going to move into this space as it sees the survivors, and this is the space of most noise as we have two noise tokens in here, and each one of the survivors counts as making one noise as well. So this space here has four noise versus this space that only has two. So this Xeno is going to move in here. This Xeno here will also move in there as he can see. And then the Hunter actually has two activations. So he is going to activate first, and he has two paths to his target space that are of equal distance so in this situation the survivors will choose which path he takes he could crash through this door ending this activation and not allowing him to move or he could take this path and work his way that way now if you have an equal number of xenos or a group of, of xenos in there they are going to split going both paths so one would go this way and one would break and destroy the door ending his activation so we'll go ahead and send him this way and then this final you know over here is going to move forward one space 
Now again, with the Hunters, they get a second activation. So after you have activated all of the Xenos that have to move, then you'll go through a second pass, activating the Hunters one additional time. And again, this time the Hunter can attack if he is in a zone with a survivor or in this situation he will move into this zone as well as it is the most noise and he has line of sight to that survivor. There's also an excellent example of this in the rulebook on page 27 if you need more references. Once you've completed activating all of the Xenos on the board then you'll move into the second step of the Xeno phase which is spawning. Starting at one of the spawn points and working clockwise around the board activating each spawn point flipping over a new card and resolving it. So let's go ahead and start with this spawn point here. So we'll flip over a card. And as you can see here, this is a mold spawn. So it's going to spawn two workers in each active mold zone. So we'll have two there and two up here. From there, then moving on to the next spawn point, we'll flip over the next card. And it is a spoiler abomination. So first off, he is going to place a mold token in there, destroying any objectives. And we'll flip it over. It is not the blue one, so we're still okay. We have not lost the game yet. And then we'll place him in there. And then with this card, it would also activate any abominations that are currently out there. So if there was one currently out there, he would get to make another activation. And then if we had any additional ones, if you've backed the Kickstarter or purchased any expansions, you can choose to add additional abominations. Finally, moving on to the last spawn point, we have a tank spawn. So with this one, with any of the spawn cards that have the four different danger levels, you're going to check all of the different survivors' experience levels, and the survivor that has the highest experience level will be the one that you'll resolve the danger level of. So if Magnus, for example, was in yellow, and all the other survivors are still in blue, you're still going to resolve the yellow danger level for the spawning, in which case the, you would spawn four tanks into that area. But he is not, and either way, it's still four tanks, so we'll place those in this spawn point. And the one other thing I want to cover with spawning is running out of miniatures. So in a situation where you don't have enough miniatures to complete a spawning step, you're going to go through a process. First off, you're going to place any remaining miniatures out that you have. So let's go ahead and say, for example, that I had to spawn more tanks and I only had two remaining. And I had to spawn four of them. So in this situation, I would place the last two out that are in that spawn point. So let's say that it was for this one. I would place them out. And then I would go through the two steps. First off, all abominations on the board are going to immediately perform an extra activation. So these, the abomination here would move one space on my bot and place a mold token there. And then I would place any available abomination I have of any type in the spawn zone. And if you have none, then you're going to ignore this step. And the other important note with this is that running out of Abomination Miniatures does not create an extra activation. So in some of the expansions or different things, you can purchase additional Abominations, or if you were part of the Kickstarter, you'll have plenty of different Abominations as well. So if you choose to, you can add those to your games and have even more of them out running amok. The final phase in the round is the end phase, and this is a very fast phase. First off with this phase, you'll remove an activation token on a bot, if it has one. Then you'll remove all the noise tokens on the board, adding those back over to the supply. And then finally, you're going to pass the first player token to the next player in clockwise order. So then our player over here would be the first player. And then you move into a new round, starting with the player's phase. Choosing when to use your flamethrower to create hellfire can be the difference between winning the game and losing the game. And it is limited as there's only so many canisters that you will be able to get out of the equipment deck. So when choosing this, be mindful of that. When doing this, you're going to discard the canister, removing it from the game, and you'll choose a zone within the weapon's parameters to target. Everything in that zone is eliminated, both enemies and survivors, so be careful where you aim this as well. Any enemies in that zone, you're going to gain experience points for. So with Magnus here, if he targets this zone, he's going to get 1, 2, 3, 4, plus the abomination for a total of 9 points. So that would move him all the way up into orange level. So then he would gain another one of his skills. So he would choose one of those to gain. So let's say he gains that one. Any mold in there would also be flipped over to its inactive side. And the only way to flip inactive mold back is if another abomination was moved in there. At that point, then the abomination would flip it back over. And again, if there was a survivor in there as well, that survivor would have been eliminated and the players would have lost the game. 
I also want to go over the three different types of special rooms. First, the security rooms are the only rooms that soldiers can search in, but both civilians and soldiers can search in security rooms. With the oxygen supply room, a survivor in there can spend an action and gain the oxygen tank supply card, equipping it to their survivor. And the final room are the airlocks, and these are the only locations where players that have an oxygen tank equipped can move out of into the external zones or into from the external zones. And there's a couple of additional rules with these. So first off, you cannot draw a line of sights from an airlock room to an exterior location, and the same from an exterior location, you cannot draw a line of sight to an airlock room. With Xenos, they simply will move through back and forth at will. There is no requirements for them. And the final thing is with airlocks, if there is mold in there, they still function the same way. You will still be able to move into and out of them through those airlock doors. And this will continue round after round until the players have either met all of the objectives that they're going after or have one of these survivors has died, which will end the mission immediately in a failure or one of the other things that comes up in each mission, such as an objective token being eliminated by mold or whatnot, where it'll end the game. Well, I hope you guys found this video helpful. If you have any questions or comments, leave those in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer them. If you found this video helpful, if you like what I do, please consider that like button, subscribe to my channel, as it really does make a big difference, helps me to continue to grow and produce videos. And as always, thank you so much for taking the time to watch my videos and leave me feedback on them. I do really appreciate it and I take into account everything you guys say to make the best possible videos. Until next time, I'll see you guys later.